Thank you, John. Um, that's, I was going to say it's a hard act to follow Barbara Lee. Um, hard, hard act to follow Barbara Lee, but that last drawing, I think, uh, tops it. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you about Wurda. That's got, I, I think the way you say it is Wurda, because it's got an extra R in it this time around uh, for reform. And before I get into the specifics, and I'm going to try and do that Federal Express uh, ad from years ago where you sort of rush through it in 15 minutes of the 500-page document and explain it to you in, like in a Shakespeare minute. Um, let me give you a little bit of the politics surrounding the bill because I think it's important because it means more than just reauthorizing Word Up. You know, we've been waiting for six months to get this bill to the House and Senate floor for final enactment by the President. And that's happening next week, as uh, Congresswoman Lee said it would occur. But the key here is not so much that we have a bill, but what it represents from a policymaking perspective overall. This bill is a function of Chairman Barbara Boxer and Chairman Bill Schuster in the House and how they figured out a path, if you will, to get around the Tea Party interests that are, have basically controlled Washington for the past several years. What Chairman Schuster in particular did in the House, where the real obstacles were, was he went around for over a year and educated members on what this bill does. And in shorthand, what he said was essentially, are you for jobs? The answer is yes. Are you for letting the American public have effective infrastructure? Yes. Are you willing to figure out a new way of doing business? And the answer was yes. So after he met with all these members in the House of Representatives from his party, he sat down and wrote a bill that had stakeholder involvement and as a result of that stakeholder involvement, we are at the place now where nobody's objecting to this bill. It's an $8.2 billion bill. And it provides a path, if you will, not only for the ports and harbors and flood protection activities for the next several years, but probably a pathway to do other policy work in Washington. So with that, as I say, WERDA really does is illustrate the possibility of getting things done. Uh, rather than being in a situation of that broken bridge and, and legislation dropping through it, what you have now is agreement in the form of how to write a bill and get it passed and implement it. Now, it's a template. As we go through, it's a template. And the message that I want to leave with you is greater or enhanced roles for local governments to do work. So, reform is the theme. And, I, and, and that is through this bill, all through it. It's all about reform. We have new, new starts are back in style. They're not earmarks. A lot of people are saying earmarks are back in the bill. Uh, great things are going to happen. It isn't an earmark. What you have is the ability to authorize new starts. Permit streamlining and project review process has been revamped to expedite it. And there's been provisions throughout the bill that increase the role of local agencies in doing the work. There's a funding committee commitment that this group pushed very hard for to guarantee that the Harbor Maintenance Tax Fund receipts would be spent. And there's expanded uses, many of which this group, again, pushed very hard for to allow for ports on the West Coast to get their fair share of assistance through the federal fund. And then there's a priority to re-examine and establish with stakeholder involvement priorities for the future when it comes to ports and harbors. So on the issue of new starts, it's a new process. So it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg approach, but here's what's going to happen. There'll be an annual call for projects from the Corps of Engineers. So anybody can submit a project to the Corps for consideration. The Corps will review those projects on an annual basis and on a date specific will provide it to Congress, the Congressional Committees in the House and Senate for review. The key here is that they must include the projects that they accept as worthy of authorization and projects that they reject it and an explanation as to why they rejected it. The committees of jurisdiction in the House, that's Transportation Infrastructure, and the Senate, that's Environment and Public Works, either approve or disapprove of that list and that's how projects get moved forward under this new bill. But there's an underlying, if you will, subtext to this. This is all about breaking the gridlock that has been WERDA or has defined WERDA over the past two cycles of renewing WERDA. Last time around, we went before this effort almost a decade and some change before we had WERDA 2007. 
We went another seven plus years to get word of today to the president's desk. By pushing the core to submit projects to the Congress, you effectively have on an annual basis, you effectively have a two year cycle in place and a, perp and a sort of identified list that serves as a catalyst for Congress to do something. The next issue that's I think really important to this group is the operation and maintenance of our harbors and ports. First of all, there, are, there is language for the Corps to identify the unmet needs in the President's annual submission to Congress on a budget process. That's important because for the first time, not only will you have the President's request for funding, but you'll also have a delineation of what the unmet needs are as a result of that request. Again, another impetus to fund ports and harbors needs as well as flood protection. Operation and maintenance revenues will be allocated on an equitable basis, but as all things go in Washington, defining what equitable basis is is always a difficult issue. So when in doubt, you create a new formula. And that new formula is it's sort of complicated, so let me walk you through it. And I've sort of put the highlights on this chart. First of all, for FY 2015, which is, starts October 1 of this year, through 2022, 10% of revenues that are appropriate go to emerging harbors. 90%, the secretary can determine how to use that funding across the board. From 2015 to 2024, appropriations that exceed the baseline, okay, of this FY 2012, those dollars would be priority dollars. And those dollars would be going to moderate high use harbors, 10% to emerging harbors, and then 5% of that amount would go to reserved or would be reserved for under, underserved ports and harbors. And then at least 10% for expanded uses on West Coast ports. And that basically is code for dredging berths, dredging to 50 foot levels, uh, beneficial reuse of uh, dredged materials. So what you see is, well, it's sort of a complicated process and it's not everything everybody wants. It puts you in a direction of sort of more defined perspectives of how the dollars should be used. And then of course, there is a mandate for annual appropriations out of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Now again, in Washington, nothing is ever easy. You've got a situation where the appropriators believe, and rightly so, that they make the decisions on funding. Congresswoman Lee, who sits on the Appropriations Committee, I think would be the first one to make that case if she was still here. However, what Senator Boxer and Bill Schuster did was establish thresholds within this bill that gradually go from 67% in fiscal year 2015 to 100% in fiscal year 2025 of the maintenance trust funds uh, revenues or receipts that are sitting there. So you have this slowly ramping up to a point where we will have 100% of revenues committed to ports and harbors into the future. Now, whether that happens or not remains to be seen because the appropriators make the last call, but now they've got a powerful argument in law that says do it. And, and also, this is key, they provided language in the bill that says essentially you can't steal from one program to fund this increased funding on operations and maintenance, and that's important. So the Corps' mission will not be jeopardized by decisions to fund at a higher level O&M. Okay, so that's the funding issue. So where are these funds gonna be used or how are they gonna be used? And this is where the key issues of reform come in. Okay, project delivery. It's all about moving projects more swiftly. Uh, during all the hearings that were held on the bill in the House and the Senate, the one theme that kept coming through was it takes too long to move these projects through the system. Other countries can build ports in a nanosecond. We tend to take a century. So what's happened? First of all, much against the Corps uh, sort of, and the administration's desires, they co codifi codified the three by three by three process, which is just integrated planning for feasibility studies under $3 million cost to the extent possible and to allow the project feasibility work to be done within three years. That would just fast forward a lot of project activity just in that one act alone. Second thing, they include in the bill several provisions for permitting 
and streamlining. There is a process in place to reconcile differences among federal agencies involving stakeholder input and timelines so that you're not caught in this sort of vortex of being swirled around in indecision at the federal agencies when, say, an EPA disagrees with a core project or something, fisheries has a problem. There are defined timetables that have to be met. And if they can't come to agreement on those timetables, then the president gets involved. Credits and reimbursement. Uh, probably the most important element of the bill when it comes to financing outside of the revenues from the trust fund. What you have here is a recognition that there may not be a whole lot of money in the couple of years coming forward because of the budget constraints. So what the bill does is say, if you've got excess credits in a project, you can take those credits and apply them to a, so another project that you're working on and not have to pay out of pocket for that project's activity. So unspent credit or unallocated credits can be used. Reimbursement, there is a mechanism to uh, allow for increased uh, assistance and facilitate it. And then finally, uh, with respect to contributive funds and recon studies, recon studies disappear and contributive funds are facilitated so that you can give money to the core to do projects. Okay, a couple other quick points of project delivery. As as folks that do the project, if you have a complaint about what the Corps is charging you on the work they're doing, you now have the authority to demand budget information on how those dollars were spent. Second thing is that on donor energy ports, assistance is provided for $50 million to allow for dredging to 50 feet. Births are allowed now to be funded and beneficial use of sediments are, used, are allowed for environmental remediation. Interest time again. We've talked about trust fund mandate. I'll skip over that. Okay, extreme weather. We talk about climate change. There's a bunch of uh, language in the bill that basically says to folks, go in the National uh, Academy of Sciences, go forth and tell us what we need to do to strengthen our ports and harbors in the face of climate change. And then, second point is that the core is to start implementing projects using resilient uh, design work, so to anticipate, if you will, threats from climate change. Alternative project delivery, very quickly, uh, there is leveraging of public-private partnerships. Loans and loan guarantees are authorized. Key here is, though, Buy America mandates for iron and steel is included in the bill. Uh, there are tax-exempt restrictions. So if you use uh, federal loan assistance under this new program called WIFIA, you can't use tax-exempt funding. And I think the key here to remember is that when all is said and done, what the bill will do is enforce a sense that local agencies have a role to play and a role to carry out the uh, activities that are authorized by WERDA. And then essentially, the federal government is there to help or get out of the way. And that's a huge uh, effort uh, that's been achieved. And I think we'll see the results with a much more pragmatic uh, approach. So I'm going, I mean, given the uh, hook, I'm gonna stop there and uh, say that look forward to a bill being signed into law by the president within the next couple of weeks. It'll be passed by the House probably on Tuesday, and the Senate will follow by week's end, and we'll have a bill to the president's desk by probably uh, right after Memorial Day for signing into law, and there is no threat of a veto on this one. And with that, I will conclude, and thank you very much.